May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be aligned with your love, O God, our strength, our courage, our freedom, and our healing. Amen. I want to begin this sermon about the story of Jesus' overturning the tables of the temple with one of the spookiest things that ever happened to me. Not spooky in terms of scary, but spooky in terms of extrasensory and beyond human intelligence communication. Here goes. Once upon a time before the turn of the century and before the Episcopal Church ordained openly gay persons and before the, the Episcopal Church married gay persons, we Episcopalians were a deeply divided, often rancorous church. Desiring reconciliation, several church leaders throughout the country thought it would be wise to choose 22 of us. Why 22? I don't know. 11 from each side to go away for five days of discussion and prayer and worship. Some of us were lay members of the Episcopal Church and some priests and some bishops. I was considered on the progressive end of the spectrum so on these matters because I had been blessing same-gender couples for a few years. So I flew to Seattle to a church in a beautiful woodlands suburb to meet with both friends as well as persons whose reputations I knew but didn't consider to be friends, and it was tough going that week, for instance. I remember that one bishop there told me with tears how personally wounded he felt when I referred to God as she. Another male priest refused to partake of the closing Eucharist because a woman priest had participated in the celebration. He, a white man, later left the Episcopal Church to become a bishop in the new Anglican Diocese of Nigeria. I hope you get the picture of how divided we were. We, 22, literally embodied the messiness of Anglican comprehensiveness, a churchy word meaning that we Anglicans include and have a big tent for absolutely every theological perspective. Now, the event I want to share is this. Near the close of the week-long conversation, our facilitator invited us all into 20 minutes of silent prayer followed by sharing whatever came to us during that period of silence. So I settled into my pew, closed my eyes, went to quiet, and then to stillness. And then I had a very strange message come to me during the prayer. The message was that I should say the following. I think a subgroup of us should reconvene and report our experience to the presiding bishop, and that Ann Reeves should be our convener. Now, Ann Reeves in this story is a pseudonym. Now, Ann Reeves was at the conference representing a position very different from my position. She was on the other end of the spectrum about ordaining and marrying gay persons. So when God's inaudible voice said to me, Ann Reeves should be the convener, someone with whom I strongly disagreed, I knew that I was being overturned. My tables were being overturned. I knew that God was up to something. The 20 minutes of silent prayer ended when we were invited to share after the prayer period, I said what I, what I had heard. I said, I think a subgroup of us should reconvene and report our experience to the presiding bishop and that Ann Reeves should be the convener. Now, when I said those words, Ann Reeves, who was sitting on the other side of the church, gasped out loud. The facilitator asked her why she gasped. Ann Reeves then said, what came to me 
during the prayer period was that I should pay attention to what Ed Bacon was about to say about his experience in prayer. I was stunned. I'd never had such a strong experience of the Holy Spirit communicating between persons like that. After the conference, my schedule was such that I had to fly from Seattle to New Haven to speak at the Yale Divinity School. And during the first dinner there, I shared my shock with a Yale theology school professor. I told him about the prayer period and the communication between Ann Reeves and me. This professor was totally nonplussed. He said, matter-of-factly, Ed, this is a common occurrence when you put yourself at the disposal of God's grace. Putting yourself at the disposal of God's grace is now one way I've come to understand the life of Jesus ever since that night at dinner. In fact, it is the way I understand the life of a Christian. In fact, it is the way I understand the life of all people who want to be used to make the world better. In fact, it is the way I understand the aspirations of Lent. Lent is the season when we will let go of everything that gets in the way of putting ourselves at the disposal of God's grace. It seems to me that Jesus' entire life and ministry was an example of what happens when you place your life at the disposal of God's grace. That is the way I understand this morning's gospel story, often called the cleansing of the temple, or the story of Jesus driving out the money changers in the temple, or the overturning of the tables in the temple. I think every story in the Bible, including this one, is to be understood on four levels, personally, interpersonally, institutionally, and culturally. Of course, it is good to learn the historic context of every story first. For instance, historians tell us that on this occasion, Jesus saw that the courtyard of the temple in Jerusalem was full of people selling a variety of animals to people who had come to Jerusalem, an international gathering, and needed an animal to go in and make their temple sacrifice. And if you did not have enough money to sacrifice an animal, to buy an animal and to sacrifice it, you could not be considered properly religious, and thus you were considered a sinner. For instance, shepherds were considered too poor to make temple sacrifices, and were thus considered sinners, along with prostitutes, etc. Money changing was part of the business vacation of the temple, and all these international visitors to Jerusalem coming in for Passover this particular day had to exchange their currency from their home country for the currency accepted inside the temple. And Jesus saw that the whole thing was an exclusionary racket. It excluded all sorts of people. Jesus was disgusted with the entire scene. He drove the animals out of the temple with a whip of cords, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here, stop making my father's house a marketplace. Then according to Mark's telling of the story, Jesus said, quoting his favorite prophet Isaiah, this shall be a house of prayer for all people. It seems that Jesus' driving value was prayer for all people. That's what message came to him as he placed his life at the disposal of God's grace. So that being the historic context, what I'm hearing for myself on the four levels of personal, interpersonal, institutional, and cultural is that Jesus is overturning the tables of my own personal life. And I am here to testify to that being the truth. Jesus is overturning the tables of my relational life. Jesus is overturning the tables of the life of the institutional church. And Jesus is clearly 
overturning the tables of all institutions around us, as well as our contemporary cultural life. Jesus is overturning the tables in all these levels in the ultimate interest of making life into a temple for all people. May I emphasize that? Jesus is overturning the tables in all the levels of our lives. God working through Jesus, through the mind of Christ, with the ultimate interest of making life, all of life, into a temple for all people. Jesus is the embodiment of God wanting all of life, the life within me, the life between me and others, the life in institutions, and the life in our culture, all of it to be a temple, a holy space, holy ground for all people. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, great professor of prophetic Judaism and mysticism and friend of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who walked across the Edmund Pettus Bridge 56 years ago next Sunday with Dr. King. Today is the 56th anniversary of Bloody Sunday when John Lewis and so many others were beaten bloody on that bridge. And then the following week, they succeeded and went across the bridge. When Abraham Joshua Heschel, the rabbi, was walking with Dr. King across that bridge, he said he felt like his legs were praying. He also wrote in resonance with Jesus' overturning the tables in the temple. And remember, he is a professor of both prophetic scriptures and mysticism. Rabbi Heschel says, prayer is meaningless unless it is subversive. Unless it seeks to overthrow and to ruin the pyramids of callousness, hatred, opportunism, and falsehood. And the liturgical movement must become a revolutionary movement seeking to overthrow the forces that continue to destroy the promise, the hope, and the vision. Could we say that Lent, every worship service, every sermon, every teaching, and indeed the whole Christian life is meaningless unless it is subversive, unless it seeks to overthrow and to ruin the pyramids? Rabbi Heschel is invoking here the images of the Exodus from Pharaoh's Egypt. And to ruin the pyramids, the temples, the egocentrism, the politics, the religiosity, the pious cliches, the voter suppression laws, the economics of callousness, hatred, opportunism, and falsehood. Segundo Galilea writes that the essence of real Christian prayer always consists in going out of oneself in order to meet the sacred other. True prayer is forgetfulness of self in order to meet Christ and Christ's demands inside of others. The crucifixion of egoism is at the heart of prayer in order to find the other. Was not that stunning extrasensory and extra rational communication between Anne Reeves and me choreographed by the Holy Spirit? a subversive overturning of all tables in my either-or thinking, my you're out and I'm in thinking, you're evil and I'm righteous thinking, you're wrong and I'm correct thinking. And the whole consciousness and psychology and categorization of life that followed. Isn't it the case that when you put yourself at the disposal of God's grace, that God overturns your egocentric I'm correct tables in the service of your being a person who has an interior temple inside your heart for all people. That doesn't mean that you don't work like hell against all forms of voter suppression laws and all economic structures that keep people in income immobility. You do it, but you do it all the while making your heart and your relationality a temple for all people. I hope you will watch my conversation with Princeton professor Elaine Pagels in the forum which follows this worship service today. Professor Pagels was with us in person here at St. Luke's last year to talk about the history of religion, both since 
2,000 years of Christianity before and also in her own life. And that Friday night and Saturday morning were the last indoor gatherings for education before the pandemic shut down all indoor gatherings for now more than a year as of today. Today is the anniversary of the last Sunday worship indoors pre-COVID-19. And in the forum today, we will see these photographs, which now seem strange, of this room that I'm in right now, absolutely empty except for me, this parish hall, packed with happy learners, with Dr. Pagels teaching us. In our conversation, which you will see in the forum after this service, Dr. Pagels, a scholar of the history of religion, says that it is clear to her that Christianity now is running the risk of not surviving unless it revives, revises itself and rids itself of all forms of superiority, including the superiority of racism. My friends, when you put yourself at the disposal of God's grace, God works through you to overturn all tables that obstruct the unity of all people. Unity inside you, unity inside your religion and politics, unity throughout the world. This is why Jesus was consistently and passionately about everyone being a member of the kingdom of God or the beloved community. Jesus embodies the way I think God wants you and me to live. God wants you and me to live in wholeness. By wholeness, I mean practicing your own religion in a way that overturns the tables and crucifies our own egocentricity, superiority, smallness, and separateness. As our Bishop Wright puts it, crucify superiority, smallness, and separateness. Practicing your own religion, at the same time being receptive to everyone else's particular religion. Trusting that the Holy Spirit, that grace is working to connect us all, holding on to at the same time our differences and our wholeness. Bishop Wright says that justice is love rebelling against everything that is not love. Justice is overturning all the tables of everything that is not love. Naomi Nye, the great poet, says that we all live inside a poem and that we can know what poem we live in by using a single word as an oar, as an oar that can get you through the days. Just by holding a word, thinking about it differently and seeing how that word rubs against other words, how it interplays with other words. I'm thinking that while the boat we are traveling through this pandemic is the boat I like to call Big Love, that the oar by which we steer that boat of Big Love is wholeness, hidden, albeit real wholeness, is the oar that can get our boat through these days. Wholeness steering the boat of big love. I was preparing this sermon last, sun, last week, and the Fetzer Institute, where I attended a conference, sent me a a little clip, video clip, that they made interviewing me while I was there, and they've chosen it to be their March invitation to what they call the spiritual practice of wholeness. So there's a link to that little clip if you want to take a look at it. It's coming up on your platform. All of this is linked in my mind with Jesus' cleansing of the temple. What was Jesus cleansing the temple of? the practice of religion in his home religion's temple that obstructed his temple from being a house of prayer or a temple for all people. What if all people or the wholeness of all people with one another and with the earth, what if that wholeness was Jesus's or? 
Grace or the Holy Spirit was not making Ann Reeves and me agree that day. We departed still holding our different perspectives. But something much deeper was going on. Grace, the Holy Spirit, was making Ann Reeves and me experience that the Spirit was using her and me in our unique and different ways as part of the divine wholeness that is hidden in all things. This temple shall be a prayer for all people. This earth shall be a temple for all people and all creatures. Free from climate crises, free from poverty, free from homelessness, free from sexism, free from homophobia, free from racism, free from xenophobia. This temple shall be a temple for all people. Bishop Thomas Gumbleton put it this way. The problems and differences we see as insurmountable are simply not insurmountable in God's eyes. It is difficult to accept that people we don't like and people who may want to harm us are also invited into the kingdom, the beloved community, the temple, the revised Christianity, the revised USA. But the gospel urges us to recognize in the stranger and in the enemy the children of God. That very insight would give us a fresh start and we could work from there. James Baldwin calls us to begin again. We are to begin again with the hidden egocentrism crucifying overturning the tables mind of Christ the mind of Christ is always interrupting and dismantling whatever is crucifying anyone may we this Lent put ourselves at the disposal of God's grace to give us the mind of Christ the mind of wholeness overturning our tables the tables that obstruct our hearts and our church and our politics and our culture being the temple for all. Amen.